So this is the fifth and last part of our mycobacteria lecture. And in this lecture, we are going to talk about the MOT or the mycobacterium other than tuberculosis. MOT is also referred to as NTM or non-tuberculous mycobacterium. And we're going to start off by talking about the slow growing species that are all of the mycobacterium species that, not all of them, a few of the mycobacterium species that cause disease that are not in, the, that are not tuberculosis, um, mycobacterium tuberculosis, or the MOTS. So in general, these are organisms that are found in soil and water. They tend to be opportunistic organisms. They more commonly cause disease in patients that have chronic lung diseases, such as um, emphysema and things like that, people that are immunosuppressed, or people that have some type of percutaneous trauma. The usual presentation is a pulmonary disease that resembles tuberculosis, although some of these species cause cutaneous or skin infections. And in general, most of these organisms are not transmissible from person to person. So we'll start out by talking about the mycobacterium avium complex or MAC. And the two major organisms in the Mycobacterium avium complex or MAC are Mycobacterium avium and Mycobacterium intracellulare. So these cause a pulmonary disease similar to tuberculosis where the symptoms are coughing, being tired, losing weight, low grade fever, night sweats. Those are the same symptoms of tuberculosis. You can get disseminated disease in individuals that are immunocompromised. And, and it's the most common systemic bacterial infection in AIDS patients. So mycobacterium tuberculosis and MAC infections are very common in AIDS patients. And MAC infections can be very difficult to manage. In the laboratory, like mycobacterium tuberculosis, these are slow growers. Mycobacterium tuberculosis produces rough, dry colonies, but the MAC organisms produce smooth colonies. They are non-pigmented, but they will turn a yellow color as they age. So if you've got a, a, um, a, a culture that's been sitting around for a long time, it might start to get a yellow color to it. They optimally grow at body temperature. They are very small rods, very short rods. They are inactive in most of the physiologic tests. They will grow on media containing T2H, and they will produce a heat-stable catalase. Now, Mycobacterium avium has a subspecies paratuberculosis, and this is the causative agent of Yoni's disease, which is a disease in cattle, sheep, and goats. Now, there are some studies that link Mycobacterium paratuberculosis to Crohn's disease in humans. So Crohn's disease in humans is similar to Yoni's disease in cattle, sheep, and goats. So since they are similar and yonis is caused by mycobacterium tuberculosis, there are a lot of, there's a lot of research being done to uh, show that Crohn's disease is also due to mycobacterium paratuberculosis. Now, the reason that no one's been able to definitively say that mycobacterium paratuberculosis causes Crohn's disease is this organism is incredibly difficult to grow. So you have an individual with Crohn's disease and there's many individuals where you can't get any mycobacterium paratuberculosis to grow. So is it because they don't actually have it and that's not the cause of Crohn's disease or because it's so difficult to grow that you just haven't haven't been able to culture it. So it's very slow growing. Mycobacterium tuberculosis takes 
you know, three to six weeks to see colonies. Usually it's around three to four. Most of the strains I've ever worked with are, you, I see growth in three to four weeks. With paratuberculosis, it's three to four months. You have to have mycobactin supplemented in the media in order to get this organism to grow up from a, a patient sample. Now, Mycobacterium consacii is the second organism in the Mycobacterium other than tuberculosis, second to Mycobacterium avium complex for causing lung disease. So this is after tuberculosis. This is among the MOTs or the NTMs. Most cases of Mycobacterium consacii infections in the United States are reported from Texas, Louisiana, Florida, Illinois, Missouri, and California. Um, the, the natural source of human infection is not very clear. This is a pulmonary, a chronic pulmonary disease in the upper lobe of the lung and rarely does it cause an extra pulmonary infection. In the laboratory, Mycobacterium consacii is slow growing. These are very long rods. They tend to have a banding pattern when they're stained. They optimally grow at body temperature. They can have either smooth or rough colonies with wavy edges and darker centers. They are photochromogens. They are very strongly catalase positive. They can hydrolyze between 80 and 3 days, and they have strong nitrate reduction and parazinamide production. Mycobacterium marinum, again, another slow-growing organism. Mycobacterium marinum is normally a fish pathogen, fish that are both fresh and salt water. And what happens is in humans, it causes cutaneous granulomas. So this is known as the, the swimming pool granulomas. So individuals can get infected if they are in contact with contaminated water, which can include swimming pools. And also it can be common in individuals that work, have aquariums or who work in pet stores that have aquariums where you're digging your hands in a lot and you can get infected that way. And you could generate these skin lesions, skin ulcers. So here's a typical lesion of Mycobacterium marinum on the skin. And again, a skin lesion common on the hands and arms because of people digging their hands into aquariums and putting their hands in, in infected water. Mycobacterium scrofulatium is another slow grower. It can be grown in a large temperature range between 25 degrees or room temperature and body temperature. It's a scotochromogen. It's urease and catalase positive. It's tween 80 hydrolysis and nitrate reduction negative. It causes cervical lymphadenitis in children where you have one or more enlarged lymph nodes, usually in the high neck region, the mandible around the jaw, and it causes little to no pain. Mycobacterium ulcerans is an organism that causes cutaneous ulcers. In Australia, it's known as Bairnsdale ulcer, and in Africa, it's known as Beruli ulcer. Here's a typical Mycobacterium ulcerans infection. And again, very ulcerative lesion. Now some other slow growing MOTs or NTMs, non-tuberculous mycobacterium, um, are listed here. And here's a diagram or flow chart for the slow growing mycobacteria. So first, you know, you want to know, is it an acid fast bacillus? It does it take over seven days for you to see colonies on Lowenstein Jensen when grown at 35 to 37 degrees? Then you would continue. Yes, you probably have a slow growing mycobacterium. And your next thing you want to look at is pigmentation in the absence of light. So if the organism is not pigmented or it's 
buff colored or if the organism is orange you then want to go down so if it's buff colored and it's pigmented after it's exposed to light it, what pigment is it is it after it's exposed to light if it's buff or no pigment you do niacin if it's niacin positive it would be indicative of mycobacterium tuberculosis if it's no pigment after exposure to light and it's niacin negative niacin negative you'd want to do a tween test and depending on those results so this flow chart is very helpful um, but again pigmentation is where you want to start off and then your niacin and nitrate testing and tween testing are usually next now your rapid growing mots or mycobacterium other than tuberculosis or NTMs now the rapid growers grow in two to five days. You're going to see colonies on a plate, very different than the slow growers, which take at least seven, um, at least seven days. Usually it's three to six weeks. These are environmental organisms. They include all of those colonii, abscesses, fortuitum, flea, smegmatis. Now, Mycobacterium fortuitum and coloni will grow in three to five days. They can cause local abscesses at the site of infection. They can cause infection in trauma or surgical wounds. They can cause infections of the eye and the cornea and endocarditis. And here's a flow chart for the rapid growing Mycobacterium species. So if you have an acid fast bacillus that grows on the Lowenstein Jensen in three it between three and seven day days it's a rapid grower you would do your three-day aryl sulfatase test if it's positive you'd then do your nitrate reduction if it's positive for nitrate reduction it's mycobacterium fortuitum if it's negative it's coloni if it's negative for aryl sulfatase you then look at pigments and you can determine from there now some points to remember, mycobacterium are important, important causes of human disease. Many of the mycobacterium species are saprophytes, like those mycobacterium teri complex organisms. Mycobacteria in general have a very unique cell wall and require acid fast or fluorescent staining. If you're working on with the pathogens, like the members of the mycobacterium tuberculosis complex, you need to use biosafety level 3 precautions. Um, you have to be very careful if you're around someone with active tuberculosis. Um, you do have infections that are caused by the MOTS or the NTMs, non-tuberculous mycobacteria. You should understand the difference between the diagnostic features between mycobacterium tuberculosis and the other mycobacterium species. You should understand the processing and decontamination that you would need to do for especially your respiratory specimens because they're going to be contaminated with upper uh, respiratory flora because it's coming through the mouth. And remember, you have all sorts of organisms in the upper respiratory tract. And you should understand that pigmentation, photochromogen, scotochromogen, and know the key identification tests to differentiate one organism from another. So more pictures of mycobacterium tuberculosis. And here's a nice chart of the mycobacteria of major clinical um, importance that shows the species, the reservoir, how virulent it is, and what disease it causes. So this would be a good chart to memorize. So we'll end out with a case study. A 56-year-old man came to the emergency room with com complaints of fatigue and weight loss. He said he'd been coughing for three months and his sputum sometimes was tinged with blood and he also had fever and was sweating in his sleep. Under x-ray, there it revealed an infiltrate in the right upper lobe of the lung. Sputum samples were collected and sent for acid fast bacillus smears, a direct smear looking at the sputum on a slide and doing acid fast staining of it, as well as culturing the smear. Now the 
acid fast bacillus smears were negative so you couldn't see any nice magenta pink rods in the direct smear. However, back tech bottles produce growth after 12 to 14 days of an acid fast bacillus that was later identified as mycobacterium tuberculosis. So this would be a very common scenario in the TB lab in a clinical laboratory. So always when you're thinking about a case, you want to consider certain points. So you always want to look at that patient history and the symptoms and trying to, to narrow down what the patient might be infected with based on that history and symptoms. You always want to think about risk factors. You know, if an individual has any predisposing risk, risk factors that might make them more susceptible to a certain type of infection. You should know which segments of the population are at high risk and why a direct smear examination is significant. So sometimes you can do a direct smear and it, it will be positive. Sometimes the direct smear po is positive and the culture is negative. Although usually if you have enough organisms that you can actually see them in the smear, usually you can grow them, but sometimes you can't. So there are um, cases where you're smear negative, culture positive, uh, smear positive, smear uh, culture positive. So commonly you are going to do a smear and a culture, but in the clinical lab the culture is usually going to be a system like Bactech. And that's the end of the mycobacteria lecture.